Markets are incredibly interesting right now. They have been incredibly interesting and they might get even more interesting. We may be at a fairly pivotal moment right now. And of course, obviously, who knows what that may mean or what it will lead to. But nonetheless, I wanted to come back on here and give a little market update because it's been a while since I've done one. And the reason I kind of space them out for the most part is because I don't think it's necessarily beneficial to be on here every day constantly hyperventilating about markets. I think for many of us, at least I know for me, it's much better to check in periodically, get a big picture overview, and then go about my day, touch grass, live my life. And on that note of checking in periodically, by the way, hi, how are you? <laughs> it's been a little while since we've seen each other. Um, and that's because I've actually been away in Iceland for a little period of time. And on top of that, I've actually been working on a number of things behind the scenes that I am very excited about. Honestly, probably some of the biggest things that I've ever worked on since initially actually starting Cash College in the first place, for those of you who've been along for this entire ride. So I think some really interesting and exciting things are coming and I can't wait to share more with you about that. But in the meantime, I want to engage with you more. I want to talk with you and not at you. But the, the broadcast format of social media makes this very difficult to do. So I have, I have an idea. I want to help you with some problem that you are currently facing in your life. So this can be something related to money, it can be quitting your job, it can be something to do with financial independence, it could be something to do with YouTube, finding meaning or fulfillment in your life. It can be pretty much anything. I want to help you solve some problem that you are currently facing in your life. I have a link down below to a Google Forms sheet that I would like you to fill out if you are interested. And my goal with this is to basically get on a call with as many of you as I possibly can to talk about this problem that you are currently facing. This call will be completely for free, but obviously I'm only going to be able to do a limited number of these calls. Um, so if that is something that you are interested in, I would highly recommend filling out this form as soon as possible. Now with that all out of the way, today I want to talk about interest rates, I want to talk about stocks, I want to talk about real estate, and I want to talk about crypto. So let's just jump right into it. So today I want to keep things fairly simple. I don't want to get too far into the weeds because honestly, I think a lot of the times it's better to keep things simple. I don't think it's a good thing to unnecessarily overcomplicate things to the point where, well, let me just put it this way. I think in markets and in investing, oftentimes there's a difference between being right and making money. So which one do you wanna be? Do you wanna be right or do you wanna make money? And by keeping things simple, I think we might not always be necessarily correct, but we'll make money. So let's start with interest rates. Now, what we're looking at right here is the one year interest rate in the United States. So this is essentially our benchmark interest rate that tells us the story of what has happened with interest rates over the past year or so. And we can see that they've had a massive climb all the way up to over 5%, as I'm sure many of you are aware. And to do a little quick refresher on what this means, we can think about interest rates as both the gas pedal and the brakes when it comes to the speed of the economy. So when interest rates are rising, they act as the brake pedal on the economy. And there's two important things to note about that. Like a brake pedal, the level of interest rates matters. So the level to which you push down the brake matters in terms of stopping your car, right? But also the speed at which you press the brake pedal matters. If you were driving and you wanted to slow down to a halt, 
you would basically progressively press the pedal to the point where you reach the level at which your car would stop. That would be a nice way to stop. But if you slam the brake down to that level, obviously you're going to have a much more jarring halt to your drive. And interest rates work in very much the same way. The speed at which they go up matters, the speed at which you press the pedal down matters, but also the level which you press the pedal down to also matters. So here, interest rates have gone up fast, and they've also gone up quite high relative to where they were before. So this led to a lot of people being concerned that the economy was going to experience the very same thing that would happen if you very quickly slammed the brakes down on your car. Now, the interesting thing is, so far, it does not appear that this economic recession has occurred or it's not imminently going to occur. Now, there's some people who still think it does and they have and they make a case that it will. But at this point, it's not obvious that we are either a in a recession or that one is immediately on the horizon. So this surprised many, many people. And because of this, this relates to what we'll talk about later in the stock market. Now, where do we go from here? What does this mean for the future of interest rates, the economy and markets? Well, there's two main opposing views that I see out there that are well presented with a lot of data backing them up. And those two views are one, the idea of higher for longer, which basically means that interest rates are going to stay high for a longer period of time because the economy is still strong right now, it can still handle it. And then eventually, maybe a recession will occur further out in the future. But for now, interest rates can stay higher for longer. This idea has been championed by people like Andy Constant and Bob Elliott, both ex Bridgewater people, both present compelling cases backed up by data. Highly recommend checking out their work. Now, this view is opposed to the idea that the Fed has actually gone too far in raising interest rates. The damage is already done. And at this point, we are either already in a recession or we're about to be in one and that we didn't have to raise interest rates this high and that this recession could have been avoided. This point of view is championed by people like Michael Green and Eric Basmajian. Again, both present very compelling cases backed by data. So I recommend checking out those four people looking into their work, looking into their views. And I think that gives you a pretty good basis to make your own assessment based off of that, of where we currently are and where things are heading next as it pertains to interest rates and the economy. Now, what I personally think about this particular moment in time is I can't say for sure, obviously, which way things are going to go. But I know that right now, at least, with interest rates being as high as they are, they present a very unique opportunity in fixed income in bonds. And that's because on a one year bond, or even on a three month bond right now, which is about as risk free as you can get in terms of your investments, that's that's a very, very safe and not volatile at all investment. You can earn over 5% on that right now. This is an opportunity that we have not had for a very long time. So for me, it makes this interesting scenario where I have currently kind of barbelled my portfolio between stocks and crypto on one end on the, the further end of the risk spectrum, and then bonds, short term and ultra short term bonds. So something like two year and, and three month treasuries on the other end of the spectrum and having most of my money in those two things and kind of nothing in between there. And the reason I like doing this right now is because this type of portfolio benefits from markets going up. It benefits from markets going sideways, because with the fixed income, I'm harvesting that yield. And it also benefits from markets going down, because with something like a two year bond, not only do you harvest the 5% yield, but 
in the case that interest rates get cut. So let's say this interest rate got cut down to 2% or in a, in a bad scenario, even something like 1%. A two-year bond is actually going to earn you a decent capital gain on top of the yield that you are earning. Now, the reason I'm sharing this is because I just want to give you a little bit insight into what I'm personally doing. But if you're not very familiar with fixed income, bonds, all of that stuff, that's completely okay because it is confusing. It is initially difficult to learn about these things, especially if you've never really paid attention to them before. So definitely don't just go out and buy two-year bonds. Don't blindly copy me, please. If you want to learn more about fixed income, more about bonds, what I would recommend is making sure you understand three very important concepts first. The first concept is the relationship between interest rates and bond prices. This is essential to understand. The second thing is making sure you understand bond duration. What is bond duration? How does it relate to the risk and reward level of the particular bond you are looking at? And the third thing you should have a good understanding of is bond convexity. If you understand those three things, then you will definitely be able to assess for yourself whether or not bonds fixed income is the right fit for you at this time. Now, if you just wanna keep things <laughs> really simple, you don't have to go out and buy bonds. You don't have to get into fixed income. Instead, you can just make sure your savings are parked somewhere like with today's sponsor, NEO. I have been using NEO Financial as basically my main banking setup, even though they're not technically a bank, for the past over two years, I think, at this point. And the reason I've been using them is... Well, there's three reasons actually. The first reason is because they have something that they call the NEO money account, which is essentially like a hybrid between a checkings and savings account. And the reason I say that is because in this account, you can save, spend, and send money very easily. You can save money and earn a good interest rate, 2.25% currently. You can spend money out of the account very easily with their NEO money card. And you can also send money very easily. You can pay bills, you can uh, send e-transfers, things like that. Now, the second reason I like using NEO is because of their no annual fee, high cash back credit card. Their credit card earns me something like an average of 5% cash back across all of their partners. I get that cash back deposited instantly in my account after making purchases. So that's the way I spend money with Neo. Save it in the money account, spend it with the credit card. And then the third reason I really like them is because all of this costs me nothing. The money account has no monthly fees, has no fees for sending e-transfers, just no fees. The no annual fee cashback credit card, again, no annual fee on the credit card, so I'm paying nothing to use it. I'm paying nothing and I get all of these benefits of using NEO. So if you wanna take advantage of high interest rates today, as well as just completely clean up your banking setup and get something that's actually working for you, as opposed to taking money from you, highly recommend checking NEO out. And if you go to the link in the description down below, you will find an offer there where you can actually get $25 if you open up the credit card and, to 20, and another $25 if you open up the money account and deposit your first $50. So that's a $50 bonus waiting for you that you can literally have in the next like 10 minutes. Thank you to Neo for continuing to support my work and for sponsoring this video. Okay, now let's move on to talking about stocks. So stocks fell about, 27 ish percent or so from the peak in 2021. And then since then, they've had a pretty substantial recovery all the way up to about 28% today. And they seem to be by this re massive recovery that they've had, they seem to be relatively unconcerned about economic problems in the future. They seem to be relatively unconcerned about a potential recession. It seems like everyone has decided, oh, things are actually fine. Let's charge 
charge forwards. And what's funny about this phenomenon of the, the rapid decline followed by the, the rapid recovery, which was something that we saw very pronounced during COVID, it was like a V. I think the reason that this phenomena happens is because we fear falling in both directions. We don't just fear falling down in markets, we also fear falling up. And what I mean by that is, on the way down, eventually people capitulate into selling their investments because they don't want to be the last person out. Or in other words, they think the price is going to fall further, right? And at that point, a lot of people have capitulated by the time the bottom actually happens is that and the reason that's the case is because bottoms form when there's nobody left who really wants to sell, right? So people fear falling, because they don't want to be the last person out. This works in the other direction too. People feel people fear falling up, because they don't want to be the last person in or in other words, they want to buy before they think other people have bought because then it means that markets will keep going up if they think, oh, I'm going to buy early before the real recovery happens, then I'm going to make a lot of money once the recovery happens. So people start buying out of fear because the markets are they seem to be recovering and then people think, oh, no, markets are recovering, I have to get back in before it goes up too much, right. And so you end up chasing it in both directions, both directions, you end up chasing it down, because you don't want to be the last person out. And you end up chasing it upwards because you don't want to be the last person in. And I think that's basically the, the phenomenon behind the reasons why recoveries act in this way, even though they don't really seem to be based on any kind of logic or rationale. And you can see this phenomenon by the way people set price targets, right? So if we if we look at a stock like Tesla, for example, when Tesla's fallen down to like 100 here, you'll see a bunch of people put out price targets that might say something like, Oh, Tesla's you know, Tesla is going to fall to, to $50 or something like that. They, they set aggressive price targets that are even lower after the stock has already fallen like 60%. And now that it's going up again, you'll see people being like, Oh, Tesla, Tesla's going to 400. Even though it's already gone up at this point from here, it's almost doubled. So it's like, the way people set the price targets is they think, okay, it's gone down, it's going down further, or okay, it's gone up, it's going up further. And that's kind of the point at which things actually seem to turn in the other direction. So this brings me to this concept of fading your emotions. When you feel inside yourself, like when stocks were here, how did you feel? A lot of people probably felt, oh, no, I need to get out. What if this what if this goes, it's gone down 25%? What if it goes down 40%? I need to get out before that happens. And then I'll buy back at 40%. Well, that 40% never came. So that would have been a mistake. And then the same way on the way up, right? You think, Oh, no, it's gone up 25%. What if it goes up 50%? I need to get in before it goes up 50%. So these these emotions that you feel when they get the strongest, that's usually the right time to do the exact opposite of what your of what your insides are screaming at you to do. And that's what makes investing so difficult because you are constantly fighting against yourself, you're fighting against your natural instincts. Markets are, are like the direct antithesis to our natural instincts. And that's what makes this game so very difficult. Now, where do stocks go from here? I have no idea. All I wanted to point out and maybe get you to think about because I think about it a lot is when your emotions come into the picture, how are you going to react and respond to them? Because we obviously can't predict where things are going to go. We can only control our own actions based on where things have already gone. So with our own actions, what actions are we going to take? And a lot of the time that means making an assessment based off of 
the way you feel and reacting appropriately to that stimulus inside of yourself. Okay, now let's turn our attention to real estate. So there is a basic flow of events that impact real estate prices that I want to go through with you. So the very first piece is interest rates. When interest rates go up, it leads to home affordability coming down. And what I mean by home affordability is the function between the monthly mortgage payment that you make and the down payment. So home affordability has gone down since interest rates have gone up because the, the monthly mortgage payment you are making has gone up substantially and prices have not come down to compensate for that. So it means that people can now afford less home with their money. Home affordability has gone down. When home affordability goes down, generally what happens is sales volume in real estate goes down. And what I mean by sales volume is the number of homes being sold, aka the number of transactions between buyers and sellers, has gone down. Fewer transactions are taking place. And that's because people who have the homes don't want to accept lower prices, and people who are looking to buy homes can afford less home. So less people are able to make a deal. So interest rates up, home affordability down, sales volume down. The next thing that generally happens is sales volumes lead prices. So if volumes go down, prices generally do too. And we have seen that prices have gone down in many areas around the world. But they have not generally gone down by that much. They have not gone down enough to offset the decrease in home affordability because that would have had to have been about a 30% decline in prices, which has not happened in the majority of locations. Now, another interesting thing to point out about real estate at the moment is people who are taking on mortgages at the current interest rate level and at the current home price level. So for example, in my country, Canada, I'm looking at a mortgage amortization table right here. And if someone were to buy a $700,000 home at an interest rate of just over 6%, look what happens here with your payments that are going to interest versus going towards the principal. Look how much of your money is just going to pay interest in the first few years of your mortgage versus the amount of money that's actually going towards paying down your principal of your home, or in other words, building equity in your home. So much more of your money is going towards paying interest. And this is the situation right now for people who are buying homes. And I'm not sure that a lot of people are completely aware of this and how it actually really relates to making a decision between whether renting or buying a home is going to be better for you. I looked at the calculator I made recently. Actually, let's go look at it together again. Okay, and if, so I have some numbers in here, and if we assume that you are buying a home in Toronto, which is where I live, I have 1.2 as the purchase price. That's honestly probably a bit too low at this point in time. Um, it's probably even higher than that, but nonetheless, we'll, we'll keep this a little bit in favor of the homeowner because so many of them get mad at me when I bring up this calculator, even though it's the most robust calculator I've ever seen. Uh, you can put in your own numbers if you want to. Um, I don't know what to tell you. It's the numbers don't lie. So in this particular case with a $1.2 million home, 6% interest rate, 5.5% per, 5 .5 price appreciation, all this other stuff taken into account, which is basically everything you could possibly take into account. Uh, a renter who's paying a monthly rent of $3,000 per month is actually going to end up with a higher ending net worth after a 10 year holding period. And the homeowner is actually going to end up with a negative net worth. And the reason for that is because so much of your money has gone towards paying 
interest on the mortgage as well as other costs associated with home ownership that the renter just simply does not have to pay. So something to keep in mind, and if you're a real estate person, something to get very mad at me about, no doubt. And yes, I am aware that Toronto is not the same real estate market as everywhere else. This is where I live, that's why I'm talking about it. You can talk about wherever you live or wherever you're looking at. Now let's move on to crypto. Ooh, Nelly. Dirty, dirty crypto. Best Ponzi in town. So. Curious to know, have you been paying attention? Have you been paying attention? Because if you have, you may have noticed that crypto markets may have bottomed. And what I think is very interesting about that is that a lot of people got interested in crypto, myself included, in the previous cycle. Now, what's a cycle for those of you who aren't familiar? A cycle is basically this four year period of time that crypto seems to cycle over between euphoria and then peer and then fear, panic, all of that stuff. So many, many people bought crypto in 2021, right? Many, 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 many people bought it for the first time in 2021. And I think a good question to ask yourself if that was you was, why did you buy it? And for the vast majority of people, the answer is going to be because the number was going up, right? At the end of the day, that's why. That's what got your interest in the first place. And that's what got you ultimately to capitulate into buying because the number was going up and you thought it would go up more. Now, if you ended up selling your crypto in 2022, <laughs> the next question I think I would ask myself is, well, what got me to sell? And the answer for many, many people is number go down. The number was going down. You thought it was going to continue going down. So you sold because you wanted to get out before things got worse. Just like we talked about with stocks earlier, that's basically the exact opposite of what you want to do, right? And so many, 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 many people bought in 2021, thought they were going to be rich. They weren't rich. They ended up holding all the way down in 2022, ended up selling somewhere near the bottom, lost, lost their money, and then said, you know what, I'm done with this, crypto's a scam, it's a Ponzi, I'm out of here. And then what do you know? The bottom forms and then it takes off again. Just when all of these people have stopped paying attention to the, the very moment you actually need to pay very close attention. Now, obviously, if you never want to participate in these markets again, that's perfectly fine, probably for the best, honestly. But for people who do want to participate, are you going to make the same mistake again, where you've checked out now, you're not paying attention, you didn't notice that, you know, 16 ish K on Bitcoin might have been the bottom. And when 2024 rolls around, let's say it's already doubled off that point, but let's say it gets up to 40 or, or 50K again. Is that the point at which you're going to be like, oh no, it's going up a lot. Should I buy again? Are you going to repeat the same patterns as before? Is, is basically what I'm, what I ask myself and what I'm trying to get you to also ask yourself. Because my thinking around crypto has evolved a lot since I experienced my first cycle. And I think this is a pretty common phenomenon, right? People get interested, then they start getting interested in the tech. You know, I was watching all the, was watching all the, the Michael Saylor videos, I was watching all of the Robert Breedlove stuff, like everything that went super deep into the philosophy of Bitcoin. And then you learn about Ethereum and the world's supercomputer. And you just go down all of these different rabbit holes and get really enamored with the tech aspect of it, right? But I think the phenomenon that happens for many people if they, after they experience their first cycle is they realize 99.9% per .9 of the tech isn't worth what the sticker price is for it. Like 99.9% .9 of this stuff is a scam. People are right when they say that. But, but, and yeah, a lot of it is a Ponzi. But what if it's a really good one? <laughs> and what I mean by that is what if because many things in life are actually a Ponzi if you really think about it. But what if all crypto is, 
is essentially the quintessential representation of human fear and greed painted over these four year cycles over and over again. And what if crypto, at least trading crypto, making money from trading crypto, basically has nothing to do with the tech and it has everything to do with the psychology of people participating in the market. Tech creates narratives, which creates trading opportunities, but at the end of the day, this chart tells me the story of extreme greed and then extreme fear and it looks like it could potentially, obviously nobody knows, nothing's guaranteed, looks like it could potentially repeat itself again. It may literally be as simple as grabbing the coins from the people who capitulated into selling because they were afraid that the number was going down too much and then selling it back to them once they capitulate into buying because they're afraid that the number is going up too much. Now, I want to be super, super clear about this. This is not in any way, shape or form a recommendation to do anything related to these markets. If I were to recommend something, it would be to stay away from them. It's probably for the best for the vast majority of people. But in the interest of conversation, transparency, discussion, I'm just sharing how I think about them. I'm just sharing what is I've assessed to be right for me based on my own risk tolerance and goals, all of that good stuff. Most likely it's completely different from your own. So do not, do not make any decisions based off of just what I've said. Please, for the love of God, make your own decisions and take responsibility for them. And with all that being said, I actually have a few important announcements to say before you head out of there. So please pay close attention. Very first one, I already said at the beginning of this video, I want to help you solve some problem in your life. Please fill out that Google form if you are interested. Number two, last year I was asked to participate in a documentary about the fire movement, which was really cool. It was a really cool experience. The whole crew doing it, it was super nice, super interesting people. Um, and that documentary is actually now making its way to being screened in Toronto. So if you're a Toronto friend, you wanna come out, you wanna watch this documentary, I'm gonna be there, you can come out, say hi, we can hang out, it'll be fun. I'll leave a link to the documentary where you can buy tickets to come see it if you would like to. It's on August 17th, I believe at 6 p.m. or something like that. Uh, yeah, I would love to see you there. I haven't seen it yet. So it's gonna be a little bit weird. I'm honestly not even sure how much I appear in it, but you know, even if I'm there for one second, it's gonna be kind of cool, I guess, to, to see my, my face up there on the big screen. Uh, yeah, and I would love for you to be there as well for that if you'd like to. And I'd love to say, you know, hi to some of you as well. That'd be really nice. So check that out as well. And with all that said, I think that's everything. I think that covers this update. Hope it was helpful or interesting in some way. Hope you're enjoying your summer. And I've got some uh, I've got some really cool videos coming up that I've been having a lot of fun making. Uh, so keep an eye out for those as well. And until then, take care, friends.